I need to affirm my kids as much as I can affirm myself because it begins with us, I think, in order for us to realize just how powerful that is uh, to give it to our kids as well. Welcome to the Honestly Adoption Podcast, the show that gives hope and insight from real voices on the foster and adoption journey. Pull up a chair. We're glad you could join us. Here are your hosts, Mike and Kristen Berry. Friends, welcome back to the Honestly Adoption Podcast. We are very, very grateful that you have joined us for this week's episode. This is season 20, episode 160. And today we're going to be talking about how to bring hope to vulnerable children. We have an amazing guest, uh, and we're going to tell you all about him in just a moment. Uh, my name is Mike Berry, along with Kristen Berry. We're your host for this show. And uh, if you are brand new to the show, welcome. We're glad you're here. Make sure you stop over to our podcast website at honestlyadoption.com forward slash podcast. You can catch up on past episodes and even subscribe to the show so you stay up to date when we release a new episode, which is usually just about every week on Thursdays. So this is, as I said, uh, season 20, episode 160. Uh, we're talking about how to bring hope to vulnerable children. And if you have been on the foster care journey or if you've adopted from, from foster care, you know that uh, kids in the foster care system are, are incredibly at risk um, and are vulnerable to all kinds of, uh, of issues and situations. Many age out of the system, never uh, achieving permanency. And our guest today on this show, man, is, is a light of hope. Uh, for kids in vulnerable places, at-risk kids. His name is Peter Mutabazi. And uh, you, Kristen, you first connected with him over Instagram. I did, as yeah. I do with many people. My mom <laughs> has probably told me, like, don't make friends online, but here if we have it. If the internet existed when we were kids, that's what our, that's what our parents would have told us. Oh, that's a solid point. Uh, yeah. There was no internet, so there you have it. But you have yes, it. Uh, you might know him um, on Instagram as Foster Dad Flipper, and um, just a really incredible conversation with uh, someone who has experienced um, both being in the foster care system, being separated from his biological family. His story is really incredible. I can't even summarize it right now, um, but uh, kind of coming that. Uh, maybe full circle to becoming a foster dad himself and now an adoptive dad as well. And so this was just the kind of conversation um, where you could listen all day. I, I still have a million more questions. Um, what a, a yeah. fun person to talk to, an insightful person to talk to. And uh, I think that our listeners are really going to enjoy uh, listening to Peter and, and learning more about his story. Yeah, he's such a positive and hope-filled person. And uh, listen, if you are a, a current foster parent or you have adopted from foster care, especially you want to lean into this interview because he really speaks hope uh, into a lot of areas. We talked about everything from uh, advocating for vulnerable children to behavior management, even about, we talked about his dog Simba, and he has a really cool um, thing that he does um, with Simba to encourage him and his children. And he's going to tell you all about that. And during this interview, um, man, lean in, press in, you're going to love this. And listen, if, um, if you guys are, I, I'm going to talk about this here later on the show, but we want to give a big shout out to one of our amazing sponsors, capable weighted products. Um, here in just a moment, I'm going to, or a little bit, I'm going to tell you about an awesome discount that they have going on right now. So that's coming up here in just a moment. And listen, let's get on with it on with today's show. Peter Mutabazi is an advocate, a foster parent, and an adoptive dad. He is the creator of NowIamKnown.com. You may know him on Instagram or Facebook as Foster Dad Flipper and YouTube as Now I Am Known. Peter, welcome to the show. Oh, well, thank you. Glad to join uh, you guys. We are so glad to have you here. We have so many questions, so we'll try to squeeze them into the limited amount of time that we have. We want to just jump right in. Um, I love the name of your site, Now I Am Known. 
what does it mean to be seen, heard, and known as a child experiencing foster care? Uh, what well, now I'm known is, you know, really came, you know, through my own life, you know, that I was a, a kid that, knew, you know, nobody knew, you know, grew up the poor of the poorest, grew up a, as a street kid. And, and so I was always treated like I was nobody, you know, until someone came in and, you know, and took me in and gave me the opportunity to be known, you know, that I had an opportunity to, to speak where I felt, uh, to feel like I belonged as well. So, uh, for me, yes, that's where that whole name comes from, you know, to be known, that he gave me the opportunity to be known, or else had he not come into my life, that there's no way I would have been known in some way. Uh, so that's why. In your life, you have had uh, quite a journey from um, experiencing childhood trauma to um, to living on the street, to attending a boarding school, to um you know, having somebody uh, show you that you are seen and known and to now becoming a, a foster dad and adoptive dad. What advice do you have for our listeners on how foster and adoptive parents can let their children know that they are seen, known, loved? You know, absolutely. So, you know, our kids come from the hard place. They, they come from places, you know, most somewhere they were, you know, no one ever gave them an opportunity to, to share their feelings. Um, you know, they're always shoved um, in, in many ways that they never feel they're seen or that they matter, you know. But I think as false parents or adoptive parents, that if we can have that in mind, you know, to always know, um, you know, that our kids didn't get all that and give them an opportunity to be hard. Yes. Uh, for me, as a false parent, I've come to learn that, you know, sometimes I see behaviors, but really that those are and the behaviors, there's something behind it. And to know that, you know, probably before they were never given an opportunity to, to say or do or feel that they matter, that they found a way to express that, you know, that if, if I can find an opportunity to give them an opportunity to, in some way, to speak and feel they are how they are part of the community, they are part of the family, that they belong, that in some way I'm really helping them deal uh, with, you know, with a few things that they're dealing internally that sometimes they're not able to, to tell us or articulate to us as parents. Absolutely. You know, I, I've noticed, because I do follow you on Instagram, um, that your son, uh, your oldest son was adopted, and you have the same last name. Names are so important. Um, I, I was just actually uh, listening to you tell a little story about uh, what your mother named you. Um, and what that means. And then uh, it just kind of led me to, again, this thought of uh, names are so important. Uh, so I'd, I'd love it if you could tell us a little bit about your name um, and then maybe how you and your son uh, chose his name to include your last name or whatever process went uh, into that decision. Well, absolutely. So I come from Africa and during my time, you know, for every 100 children were born, 50 would die before the age of two. So most most moms didn't name their kids because they weren't sure they would make it, you know, and it's not like they didn't love them. You know, it's hard when you don't know if your child will make it. When you give them a name, that means that will haunt you for the rest of their lives. So, and you know, when I made it too, my mom said, you know what? He's a gift given to us by God. So he called me. He's a gift given to us by God. That's really what it means, you know, in some way to know that I made it, you know, so that, you know, so to me, my name is just not my name, but it really carries my story as well. Where I came from, what conditions I was born in, into that really helps me in some way uh, appreciate and, and love my name because uh, of the history that it has, or my own story. And for my kid as well, you know, when I adopted my, my oldest, that I think he wanted to belong. The, the only way he could feel he mattered, he was part of my family, was to have my last name. You know, uh, before the adoption, I think that's what he worried about because he, he didn't have that as an identity, you know, uh, that every time I went somewhere, I was called a different name, he was called a different name, that he wanted to belong. And, you know, after the adoption, once he, he got my name, it's been probably the proudest thing he's had, you know, that he loves his name. You know, and I've also been able to explain to him what that matters, what that means in, in an African sense that, you know, I am who I am uh, because my name reminds me every day, you know, that I'm a gift, mm -hmm. that I'm a produce uh, and that my mom was 
proud of me. You know, so I'm proud of you as well for having my last name. I love that so much. It's a big conversation within the adoption community right now. Um, you know, to keep names, to replace names, to add names. And I know in our family, um, all eight of our kids were adopted and some of them adopted older like yours were. And that is exactly the conversation that we had. I want to know um, that I have a mom and dad. I want to know uh, that that on this little piece of paper that my brothers and sisters are my brothers and sisters. And a part of that was gaining the last name. And for our kids, um, our older kids who chose their own name, actually our daughters picked uh, hyphenated names. And we laugh because we we added middle names. Um, names are really important in our family as well. And so uh, our kids kept their biological name, added some middle names, and added our last name. And some of them even added the hyphen. And so we laugh at how long the names have become. Um, but because that was such an important thing for them to maintain, you know, some of that uh, identity from before and moving forward. So I, I love that. I love that your mother gave you that name. And I love that you're sharing that name with your son as well. Mm. Okay. So how have uh, your experiences with childhood trauma shaped the way you parent? Oh, <laughs> you know, so I grew up, you know, the poor of the poorest, you know, grew up in a home where there was never, you know, I grew up, I never had two meals a day. I had one meal I did all the other day. Um, and then, you know, at age of four, I began to realize that not only were we poor, but my dad was the most abusive man you could think of, not just to me, but to my mom as well. So I had poverty on one side that would take my life, but also I had a dad that could easily take my life uh, as well. You know, so I could never speak. I was never given an opportunity to, to say one word. I, I grew up in a home where Never at one point did I ever hear one positive word from my dad. You know, I, I grew up in a home where I was told I was garbage. I was, I would never amount to anything. Uh, I, I was, I was useless. That's what I had every day, you know, from the man who should have loved me. And so that left a hole as a kid, I think, where I longed, you know, I, I did everything possible to please my dad. But at the end of the day, I never got one positive word. You know, and so, you know, when this strange family took me in, what I noticed was they always used the, you know, the words that I never had before, like, hey, Peter, you know, you, that's really good. And I would, you know, I would stop and say, wait, you notice what I did, you know? So the words of affirmation began to really go deep every time I had, you know, I had them. But also I realized that they began to change the way I looked at life, you know, that I mattered, I belonged, I'm loved. Why? because they said them and they acted so. And so when I became a, you know, a foster you know, dad, that I knew my kids were coming, at, you know, not every child that comes from the same place I come from, but I knew they were coming from a hard place, that they needed those words yeah. of affirmation often, you know? And so yeah. then I said, you know, what I did have as a child, I'm going to use that because I longed for it. So that means my kids who are coming from the hard place long for the same thing I longed as a kid. And so I use those um, to really impact them, to encourage them, you know. And also, it doesn't matter what my child does. I always give them an opportunity to be hard because I was never yeah. hard at any point. It doesn't matter if they're on drum form, uh, if it's in the, you know, whatever word, whatever the feeling they want to, like, they have a right to express it and have the opportunity to listen to them as well. And that's how I parent really, you know, that what I longed as a kid to make sure that I can use as a dad to give to other kids as well. Yeah, that is so, that is so heartwarming to hear, you know, for me personally, because I, when, when I was growing up, I, I didn't have, uh, a, I didn't go through what you went through in particular, but I did have uh, a rocky relationship with my dad. And I know the value of, those words of affirmation. In fact, I'm even haunted today by um, my childhood to the point that it motivates me to 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 always be extending those words of affirmation and and knowing, being vigilant about the fact that our words do have a great impact. What would you say, just in your journey as a a, a foster parent, an adoptive parent, uh, and a parent, just a parent? What would you say to the parent? 
who has, you know, has struggled through this aspect of, of paying attention to their words and um, understanding the meaning of their words. What, what encouragement would you give them? Because I know a lot of parents listen to this and they're like, oh my gosh, I know that, but I struggle with that. You know, so um, for the parent that's listening, that's like, you know what, I just, I, I know that my words matter. I struggle to, to affirm my child at times and I just need to do better. Uh, what would you say to that parent? Well, so for me, I, I knew that was important. So I found a way to do that. So I wrote 12 words of affirmation um, and I wrote on a piece of paper. And then when we get a dog, I put those, you know, so we create a bandana where those 12 <laughs> words are on the dog. So when my kids, you know, when they don't feel like uh, they can hear me, but they can read them on the dog they love. But for me, also, every time I see the dog and the bandana with the words that are on, that I'm reminded to say them often. So I needed something yeah. because naturally it's not, you know, you can't remember especially for us as single parents to remember all that. But when you have something to remind you, you know, five, 10, 12 times a day, it helps you to remember. So for me, that bandana, it has words, you're brave, you're loved, you're a gift, you're, you know, you, you, you belong, you're enough, you're special that when those moments come, I'm remember, I remember to say, Hey son, you are enough. You, you are brave for what you did today. You know, uh, that I can, I can remember to say that because I have to see them often in order to remind me that I need them as well. Even for me, I need to remind myself that I'm enough, you know, but how do I do it? By really having those words, you know, uh, insights that I can always remember that, you know, because as parents, sometimes, yeah, we get overwhelmed and too much to do. And then you feel, do I, do I matter? (laughs) You know, uh, am I doing enough? Um, but these words, as, as you see them, you know, that put them on a piece of paper, put them on a wall that you pass by, put them in the pantry, put them, you know, for me, when my kids, you know, I'm having difficulty, I usually go to, um, to the bathroom or I go to the closet. So to have those words there that I can remember, okay, I'm frustrated and I'm in my safe place, but to go back and remember, Hey, this is how I'm feeling, but really, I need to affirm my kids as much as I can affirm myself because it begins with us, I think, in order for us to realize just how powerful that is uh, to give it to our kids as well. I think you're really speaking to so many of us who are um, working to do things differently in our families. Um, And I love those words of affirmation that it means so much um, to us as adults um, and especially to us as kids. Well, guys, as you know, it is the Christmas season. And if you didn't know, hey, listen, it's the middle of December. It's time to start Christmas shopping if you haven't done so already. And listen, if you are looking for last-minute gifts, I've got a great place for you to go. Our friends over at Capable.com have an amazing uh, discount going on right now, 25% off blankets and wraps, plus free shipping on all orders when you use the code JOY25. Now, that that excludes clearance, but right now, Capable.com has this amazing deal. And if you're like, hey, what is Capable.com? Let me tell you, our friends over at Capable, they are the real deal when it comes to weighted products, weighted blankets, wraps, you name it, they've got it. And they use an amazing patented technology called Smart Weight Technology. You guys, we absolutely love Capable and Capable's products. Our kids, uh, every night when they go to bed, they're, they've got a weighted blanket, weighted wrap over them. It gives them that input they need, helps them get a good get a good night's rest. So if you've got a child who's wiggly and uh, has trouble falling asleep at night, finding that peaceful night's rest, you need to check out Capable.com. That's the word cape, the word able.com. Smart weight technology right now, amazing discount, 25% off blankets and wraps, free shipping on all orders. Check it out, Capable.com. Now back to the show. So I want to ask you back at the beginning, you know, a few minutes ago when we were 
uh, when we started this interview, you mentioned you were talking about behavior and you mentioned taking a step back and realizing that there's more going on than what you see in front of you in terms of the behavior. Um, that is actually something we get asked about all the time. We were just doing a radio interview yesterday, and that, that was one of the big topics that we discussed um, from our new book, uh, Securely Attached. But I want to ask you to speak into that a little bit because that's probably the biggest pain point for parents when it comes to the connection they have with their child or understanding their child is, is being able to take a step back and realize, okay, this meltdown that I'm seeing, this behavior is an indication of something bigger. It's not just a bad, it's not a bad child behaving badly, uh, which would be the easy conclusion, right? But there's something more going on. So in your, in your journey um, as a foster parent um, and adopting children uh, from trauma, and even, you know, understanding this from your own journey and your own trauma, how do you as a parent continually remind yourself and continually coach yourself to remember and understand that this behavior, is, there's more going on. This is an indication into something bigger. Yes, absolutely. You know, uh, you know, empathy is, I think is what has helped me to really understand if I can go back in time, like uh, we do things because something happened prior, you know, so we, with our kids yeah. or with my kids, the same thing. I always know that something happened that I don't know that is causing this child yeah. to behave this way. So if I can empathy, you know, have empathy towards them and understand that there's more uh, of, of what they're going through and they don't have specific words to explain that to me, you know, that, that helps me or comforts me to know, hey, my kid has, you know, thrown a few words towards me, but really there's something else, you know, that I need yeah. to to be curious to know, you know, and that for me has helped me to always know there was a backstory that I don't know, that I need mm-hmm. also to honor the child remember i came from a world where if my dad if i didn't reply my dad within two seconds i got beatings it, it didn't matter oh. what i said was right it didn't matter what you know yeah the, the same with kids that sometimes they were never given the opportunity to explain themselves and they have known yeah. another way to explain themselves so for me i'm figuring out how what's causing that so i can help them so we can redirect this issue you know but I have yep. to remove myself often, you know, like it's something I have to do literally <laughs> a million times a day. Hey, it's not about Peter. It's not about me. Uh, let me step back. And, and, I, and I think also that helps me to really uh, approach them in the best way possible because I'm not in, I'm not bringing myself in it. Rather, I am really approaching it from as an objective and from afar, like, Hey son, tell me when did this start or why mm-hmm. did this, you know, or sometimes I let them, you know, mad, whatever, whatever hours they can take. And then after say, okay, so tell me, how did you feel after this? You know, then you realize that there was more internally that they were battling with. It just didn't know how yeah. to, and they got one spark and just went full on. But then I get to learn on how, where, and then know how to help them later. But I've made it a point that, the behaviors is not what I'm dealing with. You know, it's, it's, it's the unknown. It's what I can't see. You know, it's the words they are not able to tell me in their best way for me as an adult to understand that they are trying to scream, but I have to figure out. And I think that helps me to love them even more, um, uh, but also remove myself often, you know, often. And, and to know our kids, you know, they show us their behaviors along the way. It's not like you get it all in one day, you know? Uh, they come in small increments and they come in different ways. So you can't say, well, I figured that today. No, tomorrow is going to come in a different way. And you find ways on how to, to really be there for them. Uh, but I have to constantly remove myself. You know, it's not about me, Peter. You know, my son needs something that I need to learn and understand. And I've seen that help me uh, to have that empathy. Uh, when I remove myself. I love the way that you said that, you know, we often use, it's not about you um, as an admonishment of uh, foster and adoptive parents. There's a, a lot of language in foster and adoptive parenting. That's, this is hard for me. This is frustrating for me. Um, and often we find ourselves saying, look, it's not about you. 
But I liked the way that you twisted that a little bit to, to say, this is not about you. When I remove myself from that part of the narrative and position myself differently, I can hear what it is that my child is trying to say about their experience and what they need. I love that. Thank you so much for saying that. I know that we, um, we are white parents with black children. Mm -hmm. Uh, You are a black father with white children. And in our culture right now, um, in the history of the United States, that's a very complex um, situation. Um, And uh, transracial adoptive and foster parenting, it just is, it it is complex. It requires parents to be aware, educated, uh, respectful of multiple cultures, as well as the underlying racism here in the U.S. I I noticed that one of your recent, uh, more recent blog posts was about being accused of kidnapping your child. Uh, That's actually something that we have experienced and my brother-in-law has experienced. Mm -hmm. Um, And I imagine it is very different for us uh, and still also very scary for our children um, and very scary in the moment. Um, I know Mike's situation happened at an airport, just taking our daughter to visit her grandma and, uh, and she was 12 um, really nervous to get on the plane, hid herself down in her hoodie and was looking at the floor and, and she was scared of the plane, uh, mm-hmm. but security thought she was being trafficked. Um, and so there are some, uh, you know, maybe there are some understandable situations. I know Mike handled that with a lot more grace than I would have. Um, and it sounds like you handled that with a lot of grace too, but what a, a scary aspect. So with transracial parenting, can you speak a little bit to the complexities of that or even that experience that you had uh, more recently? Yes, uh, absolutely. But I think for me, it begins with a calling. Like, you know, I, I was called to be a foster dad. I was called to be that dad that no one forced me. No one shipped me to guilt. do that. It's just my love to to help the kids. And that's why it starts first, because when you meet, when you, when you get those experience, they make you doubt. And I think sometimes they want to, you question yourself that I've decided to say, look, you know, if you feel do that way, that's really you, not 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 me. Mm. You know, and two, that they really don't understand the, the false care system sometimes, you know. And I try to explain this way, like think about there's a train, it's on it, it it's running and everyone in it is in danger and they're about to go off the cliff, you know. And think about if I'm to rescue them, do I go in and say, Well, you are a different color, not you stay on it, you know, like to help them, like, hey, it doesn't matter what child, who they look like, they're in danger. And it's our job to be as passionate and as caring to care for them, you know, uh, that they are vulnerable, that they need us. So th- before we can go to color, let's just think of that. And, and knowing that I understand it and they don't, sometimes it helps me, I don't know, not to judge them, you know, uh, in some way to say, look, uh, I can't. Unless you want to learn, I will, I will teach you. But if you want to judge me as who you think I am, I will not let you take away the joy and the calling that I have. That I have to embrace it. Like it's, I don't know how to explain. Like it's, it's hard to, in some way to go in thinking, well, everyone should love me. Everyone should think it's okay. You know, like going, you know, hey, I am going to have people who will not agree with me, but that's okay. You know, yeah. I'm going to, I you know, I travel with my, Every time I go outside with my kid, we have a copy of adoption in the car and, the, you know, the, the placement letter. So every time the police ask me, I have what to prove. But I don't yeah. have to really be fearful, but rather when I'm doing the right thing, that when, when someone thinks I'm doing wrong, I'm going to show, hey, he's who I am. He's what I yeah. love about. And, and whatever you do, it's not going to deter me from loving these little ones. Like, you know, yeah. uh, again, as much as we, we, we try to, you know, as we help our kids to remove ourselves when we need to help them the same way we actually have to deal with the people around us who want to question us, want to judge that we have to remove ourselves. Hey, you question me that that's your issue. That's not my issue, but I would do my best to, to be a dad to this kid as much as I can. And that's how I educate my kids as well. Like when someone questions you or when someone questions me, just, you know, 
that doesn't change how we love each other. You know, that's their mm-hmm. problem that they have towards us, that we can't stop loving and living our lives that way, you know? Uh, and that's for me how I've been able to, to help it. Like, it's, it's, not, it's a calling, not for everyone. And if I really know that truly I've been called to this, I'm going to do it no matter what they say, no yeah. matter what they think. And I think that changes the... Uh, the knowledge of. and for those who want to learn you know I, I mean even the police every time they stop me you know they they, they feel so bad after because they, they get a phone call they have to invest <laughs> you know but then they yeah. find out like whoever called was wrong they're like gosh you know oh you know but at the same time you know they're doing their job and I, I can't fall to them you know but I can fall to someone who thought I was wrong but I, I can't be angry either you know uh, that right. they, they will say what they say they will think what they think but i'll stay i'll stay put to what i'm called to do and i think along the way that changes the narrative of how they think or do things yeah yeah i i love that you say that you know you, we're in control of ourselves you know we 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 don't give permission to people to take our joy um and our passion away like that is that is ours to to hold close to us. So I think that's really valuable because I think that sometimes, especially in this world that, that really, especially right now, um, kind of prides itself on attacks. You know, everybody's on the attack. Everybody is on the defense uh, right. and, and civil conversations are just out the door anymore. You know, it's kind of like this, you're, you're either with me or you're against me. And I think that sometimes people who are on the receiving ends end of attacks or are, on the receiving end of something that is unjust, we feel like we, we have to give up what, what makes, what fills us up, what, what brings us joy. And you're so right that no, it doesn't, we don't owe that to anybody else. That's our, we are, we were called to do this. This is what brings us life. And this is what we have been called to do. Um, and nobody else has the permission to take that away from us. And I think that's a really refreshing lesson uh, for parents because a lot of our, our audience members have gone through investigations. They've gone through, they've been the subject of judgment at church and their community, at their schools. And, you know, um, and it, it's, it brings us down, but mm-hmm. that's a refreshing message that your joy is yours. Your passion is yours. So I just absolutely... Uh, I'm applauding you as you say that. I totally agree. Now you have a dog named Simba, right. which is that's so that's awesome, absolutely awesome. Um, tell us a little bit about Simba um, and and how has Simba supported security and and healing on this journey? Yes, you know. So you know, I don't know. Five, ten years ago, I thought I would never have a pet. You know, that that was my never. <laughs> we all never. say that, right? <laughs> uh, but then I got I got kids, you know, and, and I noticed like everywhere we went, if there was an animal, they would really want to touch. They, you know, you would see themselves coming out, you know. And I thought, you know, uh, uh, to see the joy uh, of a you know a little boy for seeing a cat or a dog, you know, that I really felt like I can bring that at home. Like, what if I can bring that at home where they get to have it? Not just because we walked and met a dog, but it's just everyday uh, thing. And that's why we got a Simba, you know, and he's been probably the best friend we could ever, you know, we've, uh, we've ever, ever had because my kids, you know, really love Simba. But also Simba has been able to do what I would not do for me. For example, my dogs, uh, my dog loves them. They love Simba, but sometimes when they, when the trauma shows up, you know, that they have someone to cuddle with, they have someone they love that goes to them and say, it's okay, you know, uh, and that's why for me, I came up with these 12 words because Simba is able to carry them for me. Like, you know, there, there are moments when they cannot hear that from me, you know, but also there are moments where for me as a parent, I can't say them, but at the same time, want that to, you know, uh, stay so they can, you know, if dad is not happy, but we still belong here, you know, if dad is frustrated, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm enough that they're able to read it, you know, uh, but also that I'm able to remind myself of that as well. And so Simba has been more of like a vessel for us where he, he's really a therapy dog that gets to carry these words for us that they, my kids get to see them, you know, every day, every moment they, they hug the dog, you know, they get to know I'm chosen. I matter. Mm. I'm hard. I'm seen. I'm not alone. You know, 
and it's been really a joy um to see you know it's more an extended arm of me uh when it comes to to see him that it's truly been a blessing uh, uh to see the joy that he brings to the kids but also you know during the difficult times on how comforting uh, he is to them uh but above all uh, those words of affirmation that they don't go away that they are always with us it doesn't matter if we enjoy if we're not happy um that they are seen hard uh, and that they matter that's beautiful all right so you have a short film coming out soon that we were so privileged to watch can you tell our listeners more about that project and when and where they will be able to watch it yeah so that's a little bit of my story you know i just i think i wanted to give people an opportunity to just see where I came from and how, you know, what I had to endure as a kid and how someone, how one human being, you know, saw a dirty little thief boy and had passion and saw potential in me. Uh, and that's why I'm doing what I do, that I would like them to see the whole picture of, you know, who Peter is, you know, but also what has inspired me to be who I am. But also yeah. to really help people that, yes, we all have a past that was ugly or good, but we can use it for good rather than use it to hold us back, but we can use it as a foundation to do better for others. And that's why uh, that little, you know, uh, movie will come out to uh, sometime in future. And it will be on our, uh, our page, Now I'm Known, uh, or yeah. on our YouTube, Now I'm Known, that they will find it. But it's really, you know, showing that we can be the odds. It doesn't matter what you went through, uh, that you can look in the face of danger, the face of abuse, the face of neglect, the face of all ugly divorce and say, look, you know, uh, you didn't kill me, but you've made me a yeah. better person that I can learn from my like, past experience and use them to excel and do better for others as much as I can do for myself. Yeah, absolutely. And I will say this to the listening audience, as always over at honestlyadoption.com forward slash podcast, uh, we always put notes that accompany each, each episode. And we're going to make sure that we have every means possible to connect with you, Peter, list, listed in those notes. So so if anybody's out there like trying to feverishly keep up, like what, wait, wait, what was that site again? What was the Instagram account? It's all over at honestlyadoption.com forward slash podcast um, that accompanies um, this particular episode. Uh, and I love, you know, it's funny because your Instagram ca- account, Foster Dad Flipper, um, Kristen started following uh, following you. And she actually was introduced to you through Instagram before I was. And I just kept thinking like, is this a foster dad that like flips homes? That's what I kept thinking because I always think about flipping homes. And I literally for like a couple of months always was like, wait, it, wait, I, I, I have to look at this. Right. And then I realized, Oh wait, that's not what you do. But your Instagram account is absolutely beautiful. Um, gorgeous. It's one of our favorite accounts to follow. So thank you for that. Little humor there. Uh, you're not. You, you don't flip houses, do you? I I flip. To the, I don't know. Yes, I I thought. You know, I think people are cop. Sometimes they, you know, we gotta find a way to really get them pay attention. Like, hey. I, yeah, exactly. And it's a joy to like. I think we we have a tendency of I have to take the children. No, like I think I understood false care as my job is to be there for them while mom and dad cannot. But it's there right, right. to make sure that when they come back, I. I hand them over uh, with joy and love and, and pride yeah. as well. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I, like I said, it's, it's, a, it's, I, I love, we love scroll, looking at your pictures and, and following your story. It's absolutely amazing. So I have one last question for you, Peter. This is something we always like to ask our guests. Um, sure. And it's, 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 it's kind of, it, I wouldn't say it's a hot seat question, but it's, it's twofold. It's what are you reading and what are you watching? Sometimes we ask it like, what are you reading? What are you binging on Netflix or Hulu or Disney Plus or something like that? So, but I'll just ask it like this. What are you watching right now? And what are you reading? Oh, so right now I'm reading um, self, self Home, you know, self Home. It's really about how do you create a home to be safe for the kids and yourself? Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's what I'm reading. Uh, watching. Hmm. There's this show about kids. I think it's in Orange County where uh, kids choose who their parents should be, who should adopt them. Like I, I really find it fascinating, you know. Uh, that <laughs> really? I think I, yes, that I, I feel like um, if I was close, I think I would be attending that every day. Okay, who's going to choose me? <laughs> it's, it's a great humbling concept, you know. Interesting. That the child is the one who gets to choose you. 
uh, you know, uh, that's really cool. The other part we are truly really doing is we are trying to create, remember I told you about Simba, you know, how he uh-huh. carries the words of wisdom. So we created a, 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 a plushie, that dog we can give to kids for free. So we can give those kids, the, our kids in the force care, if they need them or agencies, the yeah. words of wisdom on Simba uh, as a stuffed animal. So that's something I'm learning, you know, on how to really use what God has given us in some way to bless others yeah. as well. Yes. Yeah, that's so cool. I I absolutely love that, and and I want one of those. I want I want a Simba. I need. Those <laughs> we'll send you. We'll send you a Simba. So, yes, I'd love one of those. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, listen, this has been so much fun. Um, gosh, it, uh, we could just keep talking to you uh, forever and ever and ever. But um, hey, we've got we've got kids to attend to, and you do too. And so, uh, unfortunately, we have to we have to say goodbye. But we'll we'd love to have you back again sometime. Please, please, we'll love, we'll love that absolutely. And and on behalf of the kids, uh, we want to say thank you. You know, it's people like you uh, that give them a voice. You know, that we give them a voice that feel that they matter. That when they listen or when they know what you guys are doing, that they yeah. feel someone is fighting for us. So on behalf of the kids, we want to say thank you for doing that. Thank you. Well, friends, we hope that you have thoroughly enjoyed this interview with Peter Mutabazi. We absolutely love Peter. He is such an amazing guy, such a hope-filled message, and such a hope-filled platform. Definitely, definitely, definitely jump over to honestlyadoption.com forward slash podcast and click the links. Check out his Instagram page. Check out nowiamknown.com. Guys, trust me, you will not be disappointed. He is salt of the earth. And while you're over on that page, uh, check out uh, on honestlyadoption.com forward slash podcast. Get caught up on our past episodes. And um, man, jump over to Apple Podcasts, uh, Stitcher, Spotify. Leave us a review. Leave us a comment. We would love to hear what you think about the show. Uh, We're just thankful you guys have tuned in. And we'll see you guys next week on the Honestly Adoption Podcast. Thanks for stopping by.